Welcome back Classic WoW fans. For today's video, we're going to be talking about one of the most exciting and beloved aspects of vanilla, world bosses and the PvP that comes with them. In this video I'm going to reveal exactly how we approached world bosses during my time playing in some of the very best vanilla guilds. First we'll go over how to prepare for a spawn and what systems your guild needs to have in place if you are serious about competing for world bosses. Next we'll go into a detailed breakdown of the guild vs guild PvP meta and how each faction should approach a large scale PvP encounter. Finally, we'll discuss some specific tactics for Azuragos and Kazak that I've found effective over the years. For this video, I've borrowed some gameplay footage from a couple old guildies of mine on Nostalrius. I was in the raid for all of these clips, but most of the footage will be from Chisholm and Monkey News. Used with permission, of course. The most important aspect of killing world bosses is simply being prepared. We can't know exactly how world boss respawn timers will work on Classic, but most sources say the timer was 4 to 7 days in vanilla, and this is what it's been on most of the servers that I've played. When a spawn window is open, your guild should log their main characters out in the proper zone, ideally with full world buffs and plenty of consumables in their bags. You also need eyes on the spawn point 24-7 when the window is open, and a system in place to quickly notify all guild members, even offline ones, when the boss spawns. The guilds that are most successful with world bosses are often able to kill them before the other players on the server even realize they have spawned. When I was the world boss officer in Remedy, I used assigned scouting days to make sure we never missed a spawn. Spawn windows last for a total of four days. On day one, the warriors and priests were responsible for scouting. Day two was warlocks and paladins. Day three was druids and mages, and day four was hunters and rogues. I put each class leader in charge of making sure there was a scout up 24-7 on their class's assigned day. Another really nerdy thing you can do to get an advantage here is level a warlock to level 20. This is the level that locks learn to summon. Having warlock alts parked at world bosses to summon is hugely helpful in securing speed kills. When I played in Nope on Nostalrius, it was a requirement for all raiders to have multiple level 20 summon locks. I mentioned that having bags full of consumables is important here, so let's go over some of the specific things you want to have with you for a world boss or a mass PvP encounter. Goblin Sapper Charges are a powerful instant cast AoE damage consumable that's off the global cooldown. These require engineering to use, but every class should bring them to a world boss. Free action potions are probably the most universally useful potion in PvP. All classes should definitely carry faps when you're expecting world PvP to happen. Limited invulnerability potions make you immune to physical damage for 6 seconds. It's sort of like a mini bop you can use on yourself. These should be carried by all clothies, but they are most crucial for your mages. Restorative potions tick every 5 seconds to remove magic debuffs. These are great for healers to stay out of CC, and can also be useful for druids and rogues to get restealths because they remove dots as well as fairy fire. Greater fire protection potion provides extra mitigation against the enemy sapper charges. These are crucial. Similarly, Greater Frost Protection Potions will give you extra mitigation against the damage of enemy mages. While you're at it, you should probably get Arcane, Shadow, and Nature Protection Potions as well. Mana Potions are a great alternative potion for healers in a more drawn-out battle, and really all mana users should be carrying these. Now it's time to talk raid composition. The real key is stacking as many geared warriors, mages, and hunters as possible. Obviously get as many healers as you can. Rogues and druids don't bring much value in terms of AoE damage or utility, so these classes should be lower on priority, but they do have a very important job, scouting and obtaining information. In situations where you're expecting guild versus guild combat, you need to strategically position your rogues and druids as scouts. As I mentioned, these classes have very little impact in a massive chaotic battle so let your mages and warriors do the heavy lifting. Rogues and druids bring much more value to the raid by stealthing around and gathering intel on enemy positions. Place rogue or druid scouts at any nearby flight paths, near the boss itself, and have a few more roaming around. Knowing where enemy raids are and what they are doing gives you a huge advantage. In this clip here, from the Nightmare Dragon release day on Nostalrius, the Horde and Alliance had been going back and forth wiping each other on the boss for close to four hours. We were debating going in for another boss attempt when one of our rogue scouts spotted multiple Horde raids stacked up close by, buffing and drinking. Mitaz made the call to move in, and we were able to wipe them before they had a chance to even react, despite them having a massive numbers advantage. This magnificent wipe was the result of a crucial informational play by our rogue, and in the end it was this play that earned us the server first Lethon kill. Now let's get into how you should actually approach mass PvP combat as a guild. The ideal approach is to catch the enemy raids stacked up and zerg them down with sheer force just like you saw in the previous clip, 
but this is not always an option. When you find yourself in a more drawn out battle, you will need to rely heavily on your mages, warlocks, and hunters to deal damage from range. Your warriors should control the front lines, and the majority of your healing allocation should be focused on them. Warriors need to be careful not to overextend, and healers absolutely must keep them alive while being as efficient as possible with their mana. In these slower paced battles, you'll be forced to retreat if your healers go oomp. Use the high ground and choke points to your advantage, and try to have your mages control the fight while your warriors push the front lines and finish off kills. Ideally though, you want to aggressively zerg your enemy down with ruthless precision. This is how guilds like Nope and Apes always come out on top in world PvP, because they function as one 40-man unit, a death ball, playing aggressively where every class knows exactly what their job is. So, let's talk about how each faction should go about attempting a Zerg wipe. For the Alliance side, you'll want to assign each Paladin in your raid to bop a Mage and Freedom a Warrior. Mages should cover the bops with invulnerability potions, and Warriors should cover the Freedoms with faps. This is a precautionary measure in case one gets dispelled. Remember, both priests and shamans can dispel your buffs and potions, so doubling up is important for the Alliance side. I'd also recommend popping Shadow Reflectors when you go in, so a Death Coil or Shadow Priest Silence can't ruin your initial burst. All DPS classes should use Sapper Charges here. Hunters should multi-shot, run in, and sapper. Warlocks can rain a fire or run in and get a few ticks of hellfire off, but your healers should basically only be healing the mages and warriors. They are by far the most important classes to keep alive. In a zerg situation, whirlwind, cleave, cone of cold, arcane explosion, and blast wave if you have a fire mage are your primary sources of damage besides sapper charges. And I really can't stress enough how insanely good sappers are. If everyone sappers, you can wipe out an enemy guild almost instantaneously. If you catch the enemy stacked up and play aggressively with the element of surprise on your side, you will usually come out on top. Go, 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 go! Make a video, please. Kill them all, kill them all! Oh. The same general strategy applies for Horde. You actually have more raw damage at your disposal on the Horde side, there is just much less room for error because you don't have Paladins to Freedom, Bop, Bubble, and Spam heal. What you do have are Chain Heal and the Offensive Power of Shamans. Chain Lightning is a very nice supplement to your AoE damage, Wind Fury greatly increases your Warrior's one-shot potential, and Purge Spam on the right targets can help create pressure if the Alliance side tries to drag the fight out. Because the Horde side does not have Paladins for Bop and Freedom, you'll be completely relying on free action potions and invulnerability potions to give your Warriors and Mages mobility and survivability respectively. This makes it absolutely crucial that any class with a Silence or Interrupt uses it on an enemy Priest to prevent Dispels. It's probably worth assigning people to silence each enemy priest if you're familiar with the guild you're up against. Remember, paladins cannot dispel your potions, but priests can. If potions get dispelled off your mages and warriors early, you will quickly lose pressure and the situation could turn on you. What you're looking for here is a quick wipe. Don't let the alliance side drag the fight out. Ideally, you should almost always try to be on the offensive in guild versus guild situations. As we have discussed, whichever side has the element of surprise and makes a deep aggressive dive will usually come out on top. However, there will be situations when your guild needs to play defensively, especially during world bosses. One of the best things you can do to avoid a zerg is utilize high ground advantage. There are a few specific spots where you can stack your raid during regrouping and rebuffing that will give you more time to react to an incoming zerg. If you're serious about killing world bosses, I would highly recommend studying the terrain around their spawn points. We'll go over a bit of this later in the video. If you do find yourself in a situation where you're getting zerged, you will only survive if every class knows their job and everyone stays calm and plays properly. The main thing here is not to get caught in a tight stack. When a zerg is incoming, spread your raid out around a 30-40 to 40 yard range. This will make it much more difficult for AoE damage to connect on your entire raid. Just make sure you stay grouped enough that healers can do their job. Your number one priority when the Zerg comes should be throwing as many silences as possible at the enemy mages. You need to shut down the initial burst of AoE damage. Each warlock in your raid should also death coil an enemy mage or warrior. Shamans and priests should purge and dispel enemy warriors and mages as quickly as possible. Paladins should throw bop and freedom and use bubble early to be able to spam heal without interruption. Any leftover interrupts on your side should be used on enemy healers to try and establish pressure. If you're able to lock out a few healers and mitigate the initial onslaught of mage and warrior damage, you have a decent shot at turning the fight around. Just make sure your raid has a clearly designated leader to make the call of when to go offensive. Now let's talk Aziragos. He spawns in Ashara right about here and patrols the southern area of the zone. He has the largest health pool of any world boss at 916,000. 
is immune to arcane damage, and is highly resistant to frost damage. Azuragos is a fairly long fight, so it's important to tank him in a position that allows you to deal with PvP during the boss encounter itself. Even if you wipe opposing guilds before you pull, they will be able to corpse run and res before you are able to kill the boss. For this reason, it's crucial to position your raid in a choke point. This little peninsula right here is arguably the best spot to fight the boss. Tank him towards the back of the peninsula, with most of your healers positioned on the mountain. Have hunters and mages hold the choke point while Warlocks and melee DPS down the boss. If enemy players do manage to fight their way through your choke point, you can use the mechanics of the boss itself to cleverly take them out. A Zero Ghost will periodically teleport all nearby players directly on top of himself. If you're getting overwhelmed by enemy players, have your tank drag the boss towards them so they eat the teleport. Then have your mages and warriors also eat the teleport and AoE down the enemy players. This is a very effective tactic for dealing with PvP during an attempt. Just know that Azura Ghost does a significant amount of AoE damage, so this strategy can be hard on your healer's mana, and you might have people get randomly one-shot by his cleave. You also need to have exceptional tanks to be able to pull this off, because the threat table gets wiped whenever the teleport happens. Azura Ghost was tauntable in patch 1.12, and is tauntable on most private servers, but many sources say he was not tauntable in early vanilla. One more thing to note here. Dying to the boss gives you a 15 minute debuff that prevents you from making another attempt until it expires. Try to force enemy players to die to the boss, and avoid doing so yourself. These bridges in the southeastern section of the zone are another decent spot for fighting the boss, although they can be approached from either side, so you'll need to hold two choke points, which can be difficult. Kazak is a much different fight than Azura Ghost, and needs to be approached in a completely different manner. He has by far the smallest health pool of any world boss, at 347,000, but he has a few healing mechanics that can make the fight a bit tedious, and make it borderline impossible to engage in PvP during the boss encounter like you can with Azura Ghost. Killing Kazak is all about DPS, speed, and efficiency. You can easily down the boss in 2 minutes or less if your raid doesn't make any mistakes and there is no interference from enemy players. He has a fairly short enrage timer of about 3 to 4 minutes, so once you pull him, it's crucial to focus and get him down. Let's go over his abilities so you can see what I mean. Kazak is constantly spamming AoE Shadow Bolts with a ridiculous range and also has a nasty cleave. Whenever he kills a player, he heals for around 20% of his HP, and this includes enemy players and players not in your raid group. This means that even 2 or 3 enemy players running in and dying to his Shadow Bolts can be potentially devastating to your raid. Kazak also has a curse debuff that makes you glow green and heal him when he damages you. This needs to be removed by mages and druids immediately. He also has a magic debuff that drains mana from casters, and if they get too low they will explode and one-shot the raid. This debuff needs to be removed by priests and paladins, and casters need to make sure they stay above 15-20% to 20 mana for the duration of the encounter. Essentially, what all of this means is that you need a squeaky clean pull to be able to kill the boss. If things get sloppy, Kazak will start healing and you'll hit his enrage timer. The corpse run back to the boss is brutally long, so ideally what you want to do is wipe out all enemy players at as close to the same time as possible before you pull. This will give you a nice window of time to fight the boss uninterrupted. Unlike Azura Ghost, you can easily kill Kazak while enemy guilds are corpse running, but if an enemy guild engages you during your pull, it's almost a guaranteed wipe. Have your melee stack and tank the boss facing away from the raid. Ranged and healers should make sure they are in range for dispels and decurses. I like to have one or two hunters scouting around the edges of the crater to report and hopefully kill incoming players. One of the most common ways enemies will attempt to wipe you is just by sending in a few people to die to shadow bolts, which heals the boss. Having a couple hunters to prevent this tactic can be useful, but make sure they stay out of shadow bolt range themselves. And remember, this fight is basically a DPS check, so you want as much damage on the boss as possible once it's pulled. There are two particular spots where you want to position your raid for regrouping, buffing, and drinking. Kazak's crater is crawling with with elite mobs, and there are no real choke points where you can defend against a zerg, so positioning on high ground in between pulls is a must. This large mountain to the north and this smaller hill to the south are the most OP spots because they can only be climbed with one path. If your raid is positioned on one of these hills, you will have excellent visibility of the whole area, and it will be very difficult for an enemy raid to engage you. The larger mountain to the north is the superior defensive position, but the smaller hill to the south is the better position for preparing to pull the boss. I know this might seem silly, but paying attention to small details like this, having a specific plan, and staying disciplined as a raid are what set apart the guilds that are able to consistently dominate world bosses. If everyone in your guild knows this terrain pathing like the back of their hand, it will give you significant advantages. Well guys, that just about does it. As always, I hope you found the video easy to follow and learn some new stuff. 
If you enjoyed it, hit me with a sub on YouTube. I'm also on Twitter, where you can feel free to ask me any questions you like, and I'll do my best to respond. I genuinely enjoy teaching people about Classic WoW. And finally, don't forget to follow me on Twitch, so you can watch me AoE down some guilds on Classic. Now that you're armed with the world PvP secrets of the top guilds, get out there and slay some dragons. See you guys next time.